So uh, we're looking at Christina Rossetti's Goblin Market. Um, Goblin Market is a long narrative poem and uh, it has a certain fairy tale style to it. Um, that said, uh, it is not a children's tale. If anything, it's a very dark fairy tale. Though technically, if you go back to early fairy tales prior to the kind of balderization that modern fairy tales have, it would then probably count as an appropriate fairy tale because this is a dark moral that's being conveyed for us. Now, what is interesting about using a large narrative poem is that, and, and, and by sort of following an earlier pattern of style, is that we see something uh, that is very reflective of the Victorian age. So even for instance, when you look at um, Tennyson's poetry or Browning, and in this case Rossetti, they are going to an earlier form or an earlier style in terms of, say, the fairy tale or the epic or the myth, and they're using that kind of a language. Um, this is also the time when there was a lot more narrative poems that became popular. So just like every age is sort of like a reaction to the age before it, you can sort of see then that um, this is a reaction to the Romantic Age. So the Romantic Age did have large poems, but they were all about the individual, about freedom, about imagination. And the Victorian Age had more to do about society and change and morals. So they, what they did is something interesting. So they took from the neoclassicals the idea that okay, let's do to the past, but they did a much better take on it because they know that the neoclassical framework did not work and the imaginative framework of the romantics was fascinating. So they blended the two and created these really dramatic narrative poems. So we have before us a very, very long <laughs> dramatic uh, narrative poem, uh, which would take a while to read the whole text, so we're going to do it in bits. So let's begin with the text itself. Um, it's of course replete with a lot of imagery, um, and uh, that obviously serves a purpose to the entire poem. So let's. Morning and evening, maids heard the goblins cry. Come buy our orchard fruits, come buy, come buy. Apples and quinces, lemons and oranges, plum unpecked cherries, melons and raspberries, bloom down cheeked peaches, swart headed mulberries, wild free brown cranberries, crab apples, dewberries, pineapples, blackberries, apricots, strawberries, all ripe together in summer weather, mons that pass by, fair eaves that fly. Come by, come by, our grapes fresh from the wine, pomegranates full and fine, dates and sharp bullaces, rare pears and green gauges, damsons and bilberries, taste them and try, currants and gooseberries, bright fire like barberries, figs to fill your mouth, citrons from the south, sweet to tongue and sound to eye, come by, come by. Evening by evening, among the brookside rushes, Laura bowed her head to hear. Lizzie veiled her blushes. Crouching close together in the cooling weather, with clasping arms and cautioning lips, with tingling cheeks and fingertips. Lie close, Laura said, pricking up her golden head. We must not look at goblin men. We must not buy their fruits. Who knows upon what soil they fed their hungry, thirsty roots? Come by, called the goblins, hobbling down the glen. Oh, cried Lizzie. Laura, Laura, you should not peep at goblin men. Lizzie covered up her eyes, covered close lest they should look. Laura reared her glossy head and whispered like the restless brook. Look, Lizzie, look, Lizzie, down to the glen tramp little men. One holds a basket, one bears a plate, one logs a golden dish of many pounds weight. How fair the wine must grow, whose grapes are so luscious. How warm the wind must blow through those fruit bushes. 
No, said Lizzie. No, no, no. Their offer should not charm us. Their evil gifts would harm us. She thrust a dimpled finger in each ear, shut eyes and ran. Curious Laura chose to linger, wondering at each merchant man. One had a cat's face, one whisked a tail, one tramped at a rat's pace, one crawled like a snail, one like a wombat, proud, obtuse and furry, one like a rattle, tumbled, hurry scurry. She heard a voice like voices, a voice of doves, cooing all together. He sounded kind and full of love in the pleasant weather. Laura stretched her gleaming neck, like a rush-embedded swan, like a lily from the beck, like a moonlit poplar branch, like a vessel at the launch when its last restraint is gone. Backwards up the mossy glen, turned and trooped the goblin men, with their shrill repeated cry, come by, come by. When they reached where Laura was, they stood stock still upon the moss, leering at each other, brother with queer brother, signalling each other, brother with sly brother. One set his basket down, one read his plate, one began to weave a crown of tendrils, leaves and rough nuts brown. Mel men sell not such in any town. One heaved the golden weight of dish and fruit to offer her. Come by, come by was still their crime. Laura stared but did not stir, longed but had no money. The Wistale merchant bade her taste, in tones as smooth as honey. The cat face purred, the rat face spoke a word of welcome, and the snail piece even was heard. One parrot voiced and jolly cried, pretty goblin still for pretty Polly. One whistled like a bird, that sweet tooth Laura spoke in haste. Good folk, I have no coin, to take what a purloin. I have no copper in my purse, I have no silver either, and all my gold is on the furs, that shakes in windy weather above the rusty heather. You have much gold upon your head, they answered all together. Buy from us with a golden curl. She clipped a precious golden lock. She dropped a tear more rare than pearl, then sucked their fruit globes fair or red, sweeter than honey from the rock, stronger than man rejoicing wine, clearer than water flowed that juice. She never tasted such before. How should it cloy with length of use? She sucked and sucked and sucked the more, fruits which that unknown orchard bore. She sucked until her lips were sore, then flung the emptied rinds away, but gathered up one kernel stone and knew not was it night or day as she turned home alone. Lizzie met her at the gate, full of visor braidings. Dear, you should not stay so late. Twilight is not good for maidens. Should not loiter in the glen, in the haunts of goblin men. Do you not remember Jeanie? How she met them in the moonlight, took their gifts for choice and many, ate their fruits and wore their flowers, plucked from bowers, where summer ripens at all hours? But ever in the noonlight, she pined and pined away, sought them by night and day, found them no more, but dwindled and grew grey, then fell with the first snow, while to this day no grass will glow, grow where she lies low. I planted daisies there a year ago that never blow. You should not loiter so. Nay, hush, said Laura. Nay, hush, my sister. I ate and ate my fill, yet my mouth waters still. Tomorrow night I will buy more, and kissed her. Have done with sorrow, I'll bring you plums tomorrow, fresh on their mother twigs, cherries worth getting. You cannot think what figs my teeth have met in. Mart melons icy cold, piled on a dish of gold, too huge for me to hold. What peaches with a velvet nap? Pellucid grapes without a seed, odorous indeed must be the mead, whereupon they grow, and pure the wave they drink, with lilies at the brink, and sugar sweet their sap. Now, what we see right from this opening framework is that we are given this idyllic place, which is not the idyllic. We are given two girls, Laura and Lizzie, her sisters. So in fact, that becomes one of our central themes, the sisterhood. And we are also introduced to the goblins. Now, goblins are traditionally represented as being gender neutral, but here they are clearly men. 
and it's it's like a dichotomy being created for us maidens men and clearly the two should not meet and interact and any interaction between them would go quite sour so now at the beginning it seems sort of obvious that oh it's kind of like a moral abrading against you know women hanging around with men you know it's this classic victorian prudery but actually no what's interesting about the goblet market is that it's not so much about women hanging around men so much as women falling prey to unsavory men and what happens then to the woman you know because more often than not uh, I mean when you have sort of ended up in such an illicit relationship you are sort of doomed by society and so the fate of the fallen woman is quite quite terrible so Rossetti in that sense is exploring the fate of the fallen woman the woman who has sort of given in to socially unaccepted desires and as a result of it has then been shunned by society and then the only other option for her is then death right but and that means that there's a very clear kind of you know descent that we're going to explore but goblin market doesn't do that we do see a redemption we do see a redemption arc and interestingly through the figure of Lizzie itself so the idea that even if a woman does end up in that situation and it's terrible uh, there is redemption from that situation which is what makes Goblin Market so fascinating because it could easily have been like you transgress you die great end of story perfect you know Victorian uh, moral narrative but this is a moral narrative it is about be careful around unsavory men you never know what they are trying to ply you know like salesmen what are they kind of trying to sell to you but it is also about the fact that even if should you end up in such a situation there is a sisterhood that you can depend on that will rescue you from something like this which is very fascinating so even though it uses that dichotomy it sort of breaks from that because it gives us a very different perspective another interesting aspect of it is that it could also be a reference to drug abuse in fact how a lot of drug abuse um, could also target women and that's the side that people don't speak about right as in men could do drugs men could drink alcohol somehow women don't and so women who do end up in uh, intoxicated or you know um, in a drug adult state that side is not even explored and they don't even have access to that conversation because it's just somehow assumed that they wouldn't and so no one actually deals or considers that possibility so that is another aspect and in fact if that's the case there is another interesting reading for the fruits because all the fruits are exotic uncommon and they are somehow present all at the same time and technically fruits are seasonal you don't just get all fruits at all times you you get it at specific times right so the fact being that they're all present now means that there's something unnatural going on in fact uh, there is a line which uh, Lizzie says you know um, where summer ripens at all hours so it doesn't follow the usual pattern of seasons and she says something very interesting she says um, something about the soil that it grows in and how we have no clue what and you know where is it really coming from so there's there's no guarantee about whether it's safe or clean or you know um, the fact that you know it, it uh, could possibly be poisoned with something again it sort of matches the drug addiction argument as well because um, drug peddlers would sort of try to get you to fall in with it and then when you realize you can't deal without that dopamine rush you need to take more and more and more and more and then you kind of fall into an addicted state and in fact that whole figure of addiction sort of matches um, many different things in the text so for instance um, 
you know, sweet to tongue and sound to eye, come by, come by. So are they really sweet to tongue and, you know, sound to eye? It's kind of like very questionable, all this fruit. And the language is the language of temptation. So in many ways, it also echoes the biblical story of Adam and Eve, you know, the forbidden fruit. Of Only in this case, it's fruits, just, you know, given to pleasure, given to wild pleasure, and then see what happens after that, you know. See how amazing the whole experience is, but the descent is just as horrible. Similarly, for instance, when... Um, uh, Laura is talking about how wonderful it all looks, right? Um, sh uh, Laura read her glossy head and whispered like the restless brook. That's, by the way, a very interesting line because the surroundings as well as Laura's curiosity are sort of being mirrored. And she's just talking about how luscious they are and what kind of, you know, how fair the wine must be. And it's like you can see her imagination is sort of taking hold and her language sounds hypnotic. It's almost like as if she's descending into a drug adult state even without having it. And even um, when she eats the fruit, right, um, she sucked and sucked and sucked the more fruits which that unknown orchard bore. She sucked till her lips were sore, then flung the emptied rinds away, but gathered up one kernel store, and knew not was it night or day as she turned home alone. So she's kind of like really disoriented. It's literally the description of being drugged, right? And later on, when Liz, I mean, Laura uh, sort of, um, when Lizzie, uh, tells her off, you have her using the language of the goblins itself, saying, no, 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 you know, I'll bring you plums tomorrow, and you don't know how wonderful everything is, and you don't know how great the food is. So she sounds like the goblins. So she's sort of, you know, she's become a user, and she's kind of trying to draw um, Lizzie into this world as well. So it's a very interesting kind of framework that we get over here. Now, we see the repetition of time because it's like, um, you know, evening by evening. It's like, it's a constant thing. They, they're waiting. They're biding their time. They're waiting for, you know, people to slowly fall, you know, into their snare. And what happens after that is anybody's best guess. But we are actually given a clue because Lizzie talks about a girl called Jeannie. Do you not remember Jeannie, how she met them in the moonlight, took their gifts both choice and many, ate their fruits and wore their flowers, plucked, plucked from bowers where summer ripens at all hours, she, but ever in the noonlight she pined and pined away, sought them by night and day, found them no more, but dwindled and grew grey, then fell with the first snow, while to this day no grass will grow where she lies low. So it's very interesting. It's the idea of wasting away that comes from, say, drug addiction as well. Or even if we were to go with the argument of the fallen woman, it would still work the same way because if you were abandoned and then you were pining for the person you were with, it would still function, right? The idea that you they are being preyed upon because they are somehow more vulnerable. But provided they depend on the sisterhood, then their vulnerability is sort of taken away because they are protected by the sisterhood. But we see here that since uh, Laura is not listening to Lizzie, she is clearly in a state of danger, right? And in fact, that whole bit about Laura stretched her gleaming neck like a rush embedded swan, like a lily from the back, like a uh, moonlit poplar branch, like a vessel at the launch when its last restraint is gone. She's, you can see that she's not restrained. She's using multiple, uh, you know, similes to sort of say that she's just literally breaking free and sort of like, you know, stepping forward into this um, temptation because it's just taken a hold of her and she really can't back away so and and you know she's going to fall headfirst into something that is bad because lizzie has been warning her right from the beginning right and we are then given an up close um, description of the goblins which is very disturbing because turned and troop the goblin men it's like military language and there's a certain kind of like machismo that comes through 
they stood stock still upon the moss, leering at each other, brother with queer brother, signaling each other, brother with sly brother. It's kind of like male gaze and, and made to look very unsafe and uncomfortable. And they're clearly checking her out. There is a sense of like, uh, you feel violated just reading it. You just feel so unsafe reading it. And that's a kind of description um, Rossetti gives us over here, making it um, particularly uncomfortable. And so we start to realize that there are multiple narratives working here. So the fallen woman narrative, the drug addiction narrative, the preying on the vulnerable, right? All of that is sort of coming to us at one shot. Um, but even while we are sort of, you know, um, being given um, these descriptions of uh, the vulnerable woman. What's fascinating here is that Lizzie and Laura are not, um, they, they don't have an identity that's defined by a man, right? They are not uh, women, daughters, wives, right? They're not limited by female roles. Uh, that are sort of connected or tied with a man's identity. They have an identity in many ways solely their own because they're only identified as being sisters and maidens. That's it. All we know is that they're innocent figures and they're sisters, but we don't get anything else. We have no other male figure being introduced. To us. We're only told about the savage masculine figure in the representation of the goblin. So that is the that is what's very interesting. And in fact, in keeping with the idea that the goblin men are supposed to be creepy, notice that their description is so vermin like, you know, one had a cat's face, one missed a tail, one tramped at a rat's pace, one crawled like a snake, one like a wombat prowled obtuse and furry. It's a very vermin like description. And there's something particularly like, ugh, like you just want to like eliminate them or something like Ugh, this it's kind of disturbing you know and and there is a certain kind of strange seductivity that also comes through here but it's all ambiguous it's all kept a little uncertain like in the beginning you're really not sure is, is it going to end badly is it not going to end badly we're not entirely certain right but there is a certain element of the sacrifice that comes through because um her payment is a lock of her hair, right? She clipped a precious golden lock. That's very reminiscent of Rape of the Lock by um, Alexander Pope because the whole idea that cutting off the lock is also kind of like a violation, right? Cut cutting off the hair. And it's not to be remembered, but it's a payment. So you're paying in something that's so precious to yourself, in which case you're kind of giving up something. You are being tainted in some sense, and that's the image that really comes through. So it's, it's quite a dark, dark text, but very fascinatingly presented. So we will continue very soon.